Hello and welcome to this special telecast. Over the next 30 minutes, we're going to interview two of the finest management gurus on the most contemporary management practices. Well, of course not. Instead, we're going to provoke and engage these fine minds to try and find out if indeed India can become a $10 trillion economy. Gary Hamill, Vineet Nair, thanks for sparing the time and doing this interview. Thank you. $10 trillion economy. Gary, you've got to be kidding me. Well, you know, I, I'm not kidding you. I think if you look at India, it's poised for that kind of growth. It has the human capital. It has a growing entrepreneurial sector. It has enterprises now that are connected with the rest of the world. So if there's a limit to India's growth, it's more about aspiration than it is resources. So no, I think it's very possible, but it's going to take a, a, a set of companies and an economy that can out-innovate the rest of the world. That's a precondition. Winnie, did you just throw this figure to provoke Gary? Is that what you did here? <laughs> Gary is the guy who provokes. I, see, I believe that if we continue doing what we are doing, we will get to $10 trillion in 25 years. We'll get there. If we grow at 8% with 4% inflation, we'll get there in 15 years. But if you go to villages as I go and look at the people and the poverty, I don't think we have 15 years. We have 10 years. So with the new government in place, the new aspiration in place, can we get there? The answer is yes. How can we get there? I believe there is a recipe to do that. And that is what Sampark Foundation is attempting to do, to try and bring thought leaders like Gary to the forum and try and inspire and is to increase the aspiration of Indian Inc. to try and say, hey, we can do it. Okay. And there is a way to do it so, because somebody has done it before. Okay. To start, let's hope I get inspired in the next 30 minutes. 25 minutes precisely is what you have. Gary, what's the most important thing uh, for this to happen? You know, what's the most important piece that needs to be in place for this to happen? Well, obviously, getting that kind of a growth is a multidimensional problem. And that's why Sam Park is thinking about this from the, from the point of view of education, from building an entrepreneurial sector. I look at it from, from, from the perspective of large organizations. And I think, you know, the only way you can outgrow the rest of the world, because that kind of an aspiration assumes that India is outgrowing pretty much all the rest of the global economy. The only way I think that can happen is if India Inc. is out innovating the rest of the world. That means building companies where innovation isn't something that happens despite the system or once in a while or under enormous pressure, but happens everywhere all the time. For me, that's, that's, that's critical. I mean, I... I love challenges that have this kind of scale to them. Some people might uh, uh, know that I spent a lot of years writing with C.K. Prahlad. We, I think our, our, our article on do you have a global strategy was, was 30 years ago this year. And C.K. was here in India talking to Indian business about how do you become truly global. Well, it was a few years after that, we wrote an article called Strategic Intent, where the core argument was that most organizations are not constrained by their resources. They're constrained by their aspiration. So I don't know whether $10 trillion is doable, but I know that if you don't start with that target, it definitely isn't doable. But I think so if I can add to that, you know, for the first time in the history of companies, the global companies are really struggling to innovate and continue to be relevant to the customers. And that is the reason the new gen companies like Twitter, Facebook, Amazon are giving them a challenge. For the first time in the world, the, the legacy companies are struggling to have a management structure which is relevant to try and innovate, and an empowered structure where the employees can innovate as much as it is needed in the marketplace. So this is the greatest opportunity which India Inc. has. A decade ago, when CK was here, we didn't have the resources, so we just globalized. Now we have the resources, we have the cash, we have the access to cash, we have leaders, we have people, we have inspiration, we have aspiration. So can we create new organization structures which innovate at the bottom of the pyramid? Can we have innovation structures which innovate new industries, not just incremental innovation, not just innovation on the cost axis, but disruptive innovation and keep, keep, create $100 billion new industry? If we can do that two things, I truly believe that the $10 trillion is here and now a possibility rather than just a pipe dream. I want to pick on each of the things that you spoke about, but firstly, you are essentially questioning the fundamental premise that we've all kind of been uh, been focusing on, which is that governments don't need to make this growth happen. Corporate India needs to put its hand up. Is that what you're saying, that India Inc. needs to play its part and a significant part? We just can't bank on the government. I'm glad you said that. I, I truly believe that the government can only play a catalyst role and can get us there maybe a two years or one year ahead of schedule. 
but in the end it is the innovation in the end it is the idea in the end it is the aspiration of the people who work in india inc in the end it is their their ability to dream the impossible dream they are the people who will get us there with constraints or without constraints if it is without constraints maybe a couple of years early if it is with constraints we can still get there because that is how global companies facebook twitter you know apple google they didn't wait for government to do something for them they their growth is purely out of innovation mm -hmm. so our growth can also be purely out of innovation and that is the opportunity which faces india inc but you know uh, gary corporate india has traditionally been too government dependent for direction for strategy for you know for support for everything you know uh, the last 4 5 years we've had a tough a rough patch blame it on the government blame it on policy paralysis now we have a new government there's a lot of hope there's a lot of euphoria and everyone's turning to the prime minister as if he's got some miracles up his sleeve is that how india can get to 10 trillion dollars i think so i want to underline vinit's point because i've been to india a few times over the years and there there is a tipping point and i think india is at that point now but but it's true in a lot of developing economies at least in my my experience when i talk to leaders most of their conversations about what government needs to do for us we need change of monetary policy more flexible labor markets the list goes on and on i think india is now at the point and we're trying to accelerate that point where the conversations about what do we do for india right the, i mean you have to take whatever the public policy arena is as a given now how do you innovate around that despite that over that with it whatever it takes but as long as you believe that your fate is tied to government that you're not in control of your own destiny there's no excuse for that that's a psyche change is that easy to is easy yeah, I, i think it's a psyche change so we you know what is the limited resource india inc has which is time and time multiplied by smart people is a total cumulative time which they have so the decision they face is where are they going to spend time today a large portion of their time is going into what we call the efficiency innovation reduce cost and do all that stuff little time is going to innovative incremental innovation and very little time is going to disruptive innovation because of which the impact india inc is creating out of the time they're spending is little it is 10% growth rate 5% growth rate 20% growth rate it is not and if you look at apple apple is spending disproportionate amount of time in disruptive innovation and very little time in efficiency innovation so therefore the first thing which india inc has to do is to redistribute its time in disruptive innovation for that it doesn't need the government right for 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 creating innovative structures for creating management structures which are inverted for democratizing the workplace for getting employees to innovate to participate at the edges of employees and the customer they don't need the government so it is the matter of redistributing the resources redistributing their time and i think the results will happen with or without the government you know so, i th i think let me just say this if you look around the world today there's probably not one large company out of 100 that's worked systematically to change the way it leads and manages and organizes to really facilitate rather than frustrate innovation. It can be done. There are a few kind of brownfield organizations, not the greenfield organizations that have been doing this, but very few leaders have yet had the ambition and had that systemic view of the organization and the perseverance to say how do we build an organization where we are getting the most possible creativity, initiative, passion out of every individual every day. So it it can be done and right now no country there's no part of the world that has really the lead in building organizations that have that kind of innovation DNA at their core and I don't see any reason that India can't do that. You know Vinay Gary believes that you need institutions to see this kind of a transformational growth. Do we have that, those kind of institutions currently in India or do we need to create them? So we don't, right? We don't have in the same quantity as is required and I think it needs two things. Uh first is it needs the aspiration to go up, right? I think it is impossible for you to achieve anything and this is Gary's Gary's words it is impossible to achieve anything unless your aspirations are high you will always underperform your aspirations you will not overperform your aspirations the first thing india needs to do right is to aspire higher than it is aspiring for incremental growth second from an institutional point of view we have huge number of young people i was in iit bombay today morning and the number of iit bombay kids who are doing startup and refusing to join large companies is very large So therefore we need this part we need to create organization structures which is going to attract these young people into our brick and mortar large companies invert the organization pyramid give them the opportunity to do the innovation in our company because we have the resources startups don't have the resources and those two things if we do then we have the institutional structures to use innovation to leap for growth without that i don't think we have but so essentially what you're saying is the current organization structures need to be torn apart 
Is that right? Well, I, I think it's fair to say. I mean, if you think about competing in a network world, there's just no way that traditional top-down, sclerotic, slow-moving, bureaucracy-infused, you know, CEO-worshipping organization can move fast enough to intercept these new digital opportunities. So yes, we do need a sea change. That's number one. The world is moving too fast for those traditional organizations. The second reason, and Vanit saw this with, with the young group we talked to this morning, is you have the first generation in history growing up whose primary reference point is not that traditional top-down structure. For most of us with, with, with some gray hair, that's how school worked, how government worked, how business worked. Now you have kids who are there, they've seen the web, this, this un unbelievably meritocratic uh, uh, social web where everybody, every idea competes on its own, own basis, doesn't matter who you are, where if you have followers, it's because they wanted to follow you, not because you could tell them to follow you. And then they say, well, do I, do I work in a company, an organization that feels like that, probably a startup? Or do I go to an organization where I'm going to spend the next 10 years polishing the boss's ego and struggling to get a share of voice and not really being able to innovate? It's a pretty easy choice for a lot of those young people. And so I think if you're a traditional company today, the only chance you have of attracting the best talent is you have to create a workplace that mirrors those same values. If you don't, you don't get the best employees and you don't get the innovation. If I can add something to Gary, because this is a very important point Gary is making. You know, in India, Inc., we must understand that we cannot buy talent, right? People go to a mosque on Monday or a church on Sunday, spend their own money, feel good about it, and they come to our organizations, feel suffocated, get paid, and feel bad about it. So the future of the organization is not about compensation, not about compensation structure. The future about organization is aspiration, is about independence, is about innovation, is about resources and ability to and and uh, right to make mistakes. And I think that needs a cultural change. And that cultural change is critical. And then you increase the aspiration and then you start experimenting. And that is the way you'll get to where we deserve to be. And let me let me give you some data if I can. Mm -hmm. So Gallup, every few years, they do a, a survey on global employee engagement. The last one was more than 100 countries around the world. And then they group them in the region so not to embarrass anybody. Well, the, the best kind of benchmarks in the world today, which would be North America and maybe a few of the Nordic countries, you see 29% of employees truly engaged emotionally, intellectually in their work. If you look at South Asia, the number is 6%. Now there's simply no way to outgrow the rest of the world unless that number changes profoundly. And, and, and when you dig into you know, why is it 6% or 10% or 20%, it's not the work. Around the world, 85% of people will tell you they enjoy their job, whatever that is, but it's the way they're managed. If you're managed in a way where your boss doesn't live up to the, to the values that they articulate, if, if they don't truly value new ideas and diversity of opinion, if they're not really willing to delegate and give you the chance to experiment and try new things, you go to work and you feel like you're still 13 years old. <laughs> so there's no way to solve the aspiration problem unless we solve the inspiration problem. They're absolutely linked together. You know, radical as this may sound, Vineet, isn't this a recipe for chaos, especially in an Indian organization? And you know a thing or two about how Indian organizations work. Isn't this going to be a recipe for chaos? So, yes, it is a recipe of chaos, exactly the way a mother thinks that a baby can't walk, and suddenly the baby starts walking. Then the mother thinks the baby can't go out of the house, and the baby goes out of the house. So we still have a lot of babies who are 50-year-old and 60-year-old, and the mother still thinks they will not feed themselves. So I think the question India Inc. has to ask themselves, if you want to get scared, you can scare yourself about anything. But chaos is the new mantra. Chaos is all about, see, chaos, chaos creates innovation. So it, it is either you have to create a paranoid organization which is very chaotic, which is, which is trying to do the impossible. The innovation gets created when people attempt to do something which others have never attempted to do before. Magic gets created in the interface where impossible happens, and impossible happens outside the boundaries of logic and reason. So when you're attempting disruptive innovation outside the boundaries of logic and reason, how can it be done without chaos? Mm -hmm. Now you have to structure the chaos, and that is what structured innovation is all about. Mm -hmm. If you suffocate it just because you want order, then you will be only on that efficiency innovation, and you will have very limited impact on growth and on the society. 
If you want to be on the disruptive innovation, then you will have to have structures around chaos. You have to celebrate chaos, and that is how you will create huge impact. But you know, Gary, a lo yeah. lot of the Indian corporations are, you know, promote a family-driven, managed, control. Uh, uh, there is a certain amount of paranoia over ownership, management. How easy is it going to be for such organizations to radically transform uh, their DNA? You know, obviously, it's not going to be easy. But then again, you know, if you think about that as management 2.0, it wasn't very easy to invent management 1.0. If you go back 100 and 120 years, we were taking people off the farms and the fields, the craftsmen, you know, people who, who never showed up at, at the same time every day. In, 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 in 1910, 1912, Ford Motor Company had a 30% employee turnover per month, right? So just the very idea of inventing this large-scale, predictable, discipline organization was an incredible human accomplishment. Well. Now we're going to have to reinvent it. But I think, you know, human beings invented in the first place. It is going to be a challenge. It's going to be step by step. It's not, you don't tear everything up overnight. But if you look at the journey that HCL has been on, some other companies, it's absolutely doable. But it does start with leaders being willing to trust people in ways they haven't before. That doesn't mean blind trust, but, but the kind of radical decentralization that, that we've been talking about, there are preconditions. People have to have the information they need, real time to make smart decisions. They need to have the competence. We need to invest in them so they think like, they think like the owner, they think like business people. You can trust them to take those decisions. And we need to have very short feedback loops so when they take a decision, they see the results and it's either is good or bad, but they know then how to adjust. But you know, I, I find it ironic. I, I go around the world, you know, many, many big cities, just about everybody you see walking down a street today, they can afford a two-wheeler or they can afford a car. They make these independent economic decisions. <laughs> but at work, they can't buy a chair without asking somebody's permission, right? It's, it's just kind of silly. We trust people in every aspect of their life, but at work, we treat them as if, you know, when they put the badge on, their brain goes up in smoke. So that, that I think, is an attitude. It's a leadership attitude. It has to change. But to change it, you have to give people the competence, the information, the feedback, so they can make smart decisions wherever they are in the organization. And you have to do one other thing. So it's a very interesting story that there was a very rich businessman who had a beautiful house. He called a plumber to his house. And for half an hour or one hour, he was telling how beautiful the house is and how each element of the house was very pretty. And after one hour, the plumber said, that's fine, but where the hell is the leak? Now, if you imagine an employee walking into your organization, you tell them how great the organization is and how proud that person should be about being in that organization, but you don't tell him where the hell is the leak. So in addition to what Gary is saying, you also have to tell the employee where the hell is the leak. Otherwise, how will they fix the issues which need to be fixed? If you continue hiding that away from them, nothing is going to change. You know, let, me, let me just build on that one second <laughs> because we, we've had a tendency, and, I, and it's very true in India, and it's true in America and Europe, we often have a tendency to see organizations as an extension of the CEO's ego and personality. <laughs> and when that's the case, it's very difficult as a CEO to admit you have a leak, to admit the problem, because you're kind of admitting your own culpability. Your mirror, own mirror on the wall, I'm the prettiest of all. And, and that's, that's <laughs> the mantra that we like to tell ourselves. And so if, if, you, if you think about why do large organizations, why have they missed so much of the future? Why is it the upstarts that, that are creating the future? It's because the old guard is still living in, 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 in a realm of denial. They cannot admit that you're being outmaneuvered, out-innovated, out-competed. Yeah. They, they want to believe that success is some kind of a birthright and it will continue no matter what. So if you can't start out by going to the organization saying, guess what, success is incredibly fragile. We are going to have to earn it every day. Here are the problems. Here's where we, we, we fall short. But often it's the opposite. It's like, it's all right, we're going to take care of this. You can trust those of us up on the 20th floor to make the right decisions rather than inviting people into helping you solve the toughest problem. But you know, we need the other downside. I don't know if it's fair to call it a downside uh, of such a radical transformation. Is that the premium of experience no longer stays? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And someone's worked 20 years, has, you know, burned midnight all with a particular organization, and then you have a 21 year old who's coming in with a radical idea. Uh, and he's, you know, so, so the whole premium that we've attached to experience and loyalty is irrelevant. Is that okay? So the question is experience in what, right? So if you were an experienced, let's say if you are an experienced artisan and suddenly your job has been taken over by robots, should I still be relevant experience? The world has changed. 
So initially, globalization, rolling out offices, you know, going global, marketing, all those stuff used to be very relevant. Now that has been taken over by digital. The skills which are required right now is not operation skills, but modeling skills, by ability to take predictive data and take very instant decisions to create unique experiences for the customer rather than standardization, operations excellence, and cost. So therefore, if you have experience in standardization, operations excellence, and cost, and that is what you know, you will force the organization in that fashion. So we need le new leaders. We need to train these leaders to think differently and saying that experience is no more relevant because that is table stakes because of digital organization. You need new experiences. You're, you need ability to be able to ex extract more out of it, which the young people are bringing in. You can also do it. If you give up the past and do the future, I think it's possible. How tough is well, it? I think, I think your premise is right. I think thinking about some of these new models is very threatening to people who spent their careers climbing the corporate ladder, you know, you can't pay, the paying the attention game to the boss and so on. And, and there, was, there was two premises we had in that old model. One is, and, and now they're both mostly wrong. One premise was that leaders are going to know more. Because in, in a kind of a stable world, remember, most information went up. You reported to your boss, and 10 people reported to one, and they reported. So it was literally true that as you climb the ladder, each person had a, had a bigger view. They had, they'd know more. And so your boss say, well, if you only knew what I knew, then you'd understand, <laughs> right? Well, now data is free, and everybody has it. So the boss no longer knows more. Uh, number two, as a boss, you believe you could control the conversation. You could set the agenda. This is what's important. Well, now everybody is talking laterally. They already have a point of view. They, 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 they have their own sense of what's important and what we should be working on. And so you can no longer exercise leadership authority in the way you used to. And then you take a third element, this young generation coming to work, which is the most authority phobic in history because they've seen a lot of their seniors screw things up. So they're, they're understandably skeptical. And I think what that means in a very practical way is if you want to be a leader today, you have to accumulate and build your influence in a completely different way. It is no longer your position. If you have to use your positional authority, you've just told people you're not a leader. You're a bureaucrat. So you have to build your leadership capital by being somebody people want to follow. That means having a point of view about the future, being a great mentor, helping people succeed, connecting people with each other and with ideas, clearing out the bureaucracy in the organization. That's what it means to be a leader. But the idea of leadership is going to be completely divorced increasingly from where you sit in some particular hierarchy. And if, you've, if your leadership power depends on that, you're in trouble. I, I would add that the definition of inspired leader, which is relevant for today, is the ability to get people to do what they want to do, rather than get people to do what you wanted them to do. And once people understand the difference, I think they can be inspired leader. And that's what is relevant for the country of tomorrow. So what both of you are saying is the most critical thing is to reform leadership. I mean, here we talk of land reforms, labor reforms, and telecom reforms, and whatnot. What needs serious reform is leadership. Is that right? Well, I, I think it's a huge part of it. It's not the only thing. You know, in the end, a country like India, the resources it has are people. And that's, that's true for every country. We're in the creative economy. We're not in the industrial economy anymore, although there are parts of it that are there. We're not in the service of the knowledge. We are now in the creative economy. And so it's how do you get the most out of that talent? And as Vineet is just saying, getting the most out of people in the old model meant working them harder, controlling them closer, pushing them harder. Now it means creating organizations where people can work on the things they want to work on, are free to experiment, and so on. And, and if you, know, you look at the companies that have consistently outperformed over the last decade, all of them are the ones that rate at the very top of the best places to work, where people do feel empowered, they have a chance to work on their passions, they do feel that their voices are heard, they're asked to contribute, and I think that's the real leverage for India Inc. And that's why I said the aspiration in terms of $10 trillion, you cannot separate that as a challenge from equivalent challenge of saying, how do we create the most turned on, excited, enthusiastic employees anywhere in the world? If we fail at that, we'll fail at the $10 trillion. So I would say increase aspiration, increase inspiration, and increase innovation. And with the combination of three, have millions of people, 500 million youth of India, mm -hmm. going after this problem, $10 trillion will happen tomorrow rather than day after tomorrow. On that 
fantastically optimistic note let's uh, close this interview thank you so much for joining in and uh, and inspiring a lot of uh, ceos hopefully to think big to think innovative and to out innovate uh, some of their peers around the world thank you so much kari thank you so much please thank you so much thank you thank awesome. you Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.